Good morning. Good morning, Prof. How are you? Fine, and you? Great. Uh, good morning, everyone who's joined us uh, for this third session in our SAGE webinar series. I will give it another minute for uh, people to log on to the platform, and then I will officially open this uh, session. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we can keep our cameras off and uh, put it um, microphones on mute. That would be great. Uh, Oh, well, a minute has passed. I see we're at 11.01, and I think we can get today started. Uh, my name is Aliza LaRue. I am part of the SAGE Steering Committee. Uh, Sersha Naidu is also on the platform, um, also part of the SAGE uh, Steering Committee, who's been arranging this uh, webinar series. Uh, so today is the third session, the third out of four. And we have quite a mix of uh, speakers here from remote sensing experts to those who are the practitioners and uh, working in 
uh, local and district municipalities to try and um, apply and um, implement uh, practical environmental management. Uh, but we are going to start with Liesl Lewis today, uh, who uh, is also at my institution, the University of the Free State. So uh, Liesl Lewis is an Associate Professor of Public Administration and Management at the University of the Free State here in South Africa. Um, and she has 13 years of work experience in the public service before she joined the UFS in 2006. Her research in public administration and management is guided by the belief that it is an obligation and duty to pursue, capture, discover, create, and transmit knowledge about how the public sector is managed. You can see she's excited about that. Um, Liesl aims to question leadership accountability, decision-making processes, and ways of rendering services to communities amidst this volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous environment. Her aim is buoyed by the notion that traditional public leadership approaches, but even more so conventional ways of leading, are transforming under the impetus of the 21st century. And it is quite true, transforming is <laughs> the essence of the game at the moment. So thank you, Liesl. I will hand over to you. I will be muting and having my video off. The floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Professor, and, and welcome, colleagues. Uh, let me just try to share my slides with you. And uh, then I think uh, I should not, I just need to share the correct slides. Otherwise, I'm going to give you a class, and that is not what you want. All right, is it visible, Alisa? Is it visible? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, Aliza um, and colleagues, thank you so much for this opportunity offered to me to talk about something that I'm very passionate about. Uh, I'm just going to start off. I have a little bit of a time limit that was given to me. So let's start talking about accountable green leadership and strengthening the democracy of South Africa. My background is in public administration. So this is uh, my passion and I would like to share a few ideas with you. All right, so uh, the talk is about leadership and leadership excellence. And I think you will agree that in the 21st century um, is uh, leadership under severe scrutiny because of the radical changing world. Uh, one of the reasons is that innovations like we experience every day are creating new leadership models and in the process destroying old leaders, uh, leadership recipes, if I can call it that. It then appears or it appears as if conventional ways of leading will no longer suffice in this fourth industrial revolution period. Now the fierce current debate in the literature about leadership and leadership excellence or the lack thereof, may be one of the most critical issues, I think, at present time. And this goes alongside with issues such as poverty, hunger, inequality, um, climate change, and so forth. So also based on the 17 development goals, it could even be argued that the mentioned issues that we experience themselves are maybe symptomatic of poor leadership in the world. Recent unrest in KwaZulu-Natal, for example, is also symptomatic of the country's leadership that we experience at the moment. It's Excuse me? Can I continue? So you were breaking up. I'm not sure if it's on your side or... Can you hear me now? Yes, I can see my internet connection is unstable, so maybe it's just on my side. Um, if anybody has other issues, please just type in the chat box, um, but otherwise, yes, please go ahead, Lisa. All right. So it can be asserted that those nations and societies and even communities, very important, that can de demonstrate that leadership excellence is consistently applied and ahead of time will definitely dominate the future. So, ladies and gentlemen, with this short introduction and the dog barking in the background, I'm so sorry for that, my presentation today will focus on accountable green leadership and strengthening uh, the democracy of South Africa. So, let me first of all start with leadership 
as we know it? What, what are we used to? And I have just uh, given you a few definitions there. Uh, leadership is defined as a process of influencing the activities of the individual or a group in an effort towards goal achievement. Leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less, according to Maxwell. And leadership is the art of influencing others to the maximum performance to accomplish any task, objective, or project of going. Now, these boundaries that we were used to have allowed researchers to narrow down and identify 100 traits or qualities or characteristics um, that differentiate uh, leaders from non-leaders as we, as we know it. Um, however, there, there, there are three traits uh, which, which, is, uh, which are intelligence, dominance, and masculinity that have been commonly related to leader emergence, according to Judge Bono and Gerard. But um, according to Petri, for example, I'm just giving a few uh, uh, ideas from researchers, Le leadership strategies in the past focus on the individual. If you, if you can recall that, what makes a good leader? and which characteristics should be developed in order to, uh, for a leader to survive. So that is what we are used to, but this paper today is not, the purpose of this paper is not to present enormous um, amount or number of theories and not even to, to, to state what is more, le the less effective leadership styles or not, but rather to give the idea of where we are today. So in order for us to move forward. So, I want to stay with the de definition concerning leadership um, that, that is, is relevant for me today, also within my field. And that is uh, looking at the King Four report on corporate governance, who links leadership to ethical culture, good performance, effective control, and legitimacy. Moving to the second concept of this paper, that is accountable. Um, if we talk about accountability, the King reports set the direction South African leaders must follow. The King Three report, if you can remember, emphasized uh, fairness, accountability, responsibility, transparency, and th those were also seen as the four pillars for future corporate governance. The King Four report again focus more on a holistic principle and outcome based rather than a rule based approach which is which is positive for me and this outcome based approach emphasizes again ethical leadership attitude mindset and behavior now from both of these reports uh, the aspect of accountability, which is the aspect that I'm trying to introduce now, or most, more so the importance of leadership accountability is so clear. Um, just a few examples. We have cabinet members who are accountable to parliament. We have provincial executive councils who are accountable to the provincial legislatures. We have audit committees who are accountable for their performance. We have municipalities who are accountable to committees. SMEs are held accountable uh, by the customers for responsible corporate citizens. I think someone else's mic is on. And so is that accountable to citizens again? So, and, and at the end of the day, they are all accountable to National Assembly. So uh, accountability is really um, a very much captured in, in documents, especially also the constitution. I just want to quickly refer to section 24 of the constitution that talks about environmental rights and clearly states the accountability there. Everyone has the right to an environment that is not harmful to the health and well-being. Uh, to have the environment protected, etc. All right, so section 24 of the constitution also then places a duty on the three spheres of government and government leaders to take responsible steps, including making laws and also ensuring sustainable development. So uh, other thing, just the last thing that I want to mention here that, that might be a challenge for the future or is currently a challenge. In the, in the constitution, we also have 
the concept of cooperative relationship and cooperative government governance between the three spheres of government. Now, however, this relationship um, is there and it's mentioned. It has been undermined um, by a significant overlap in, in, in the application thereof. And this has resulted in legislative and institutional fragmentation during the past decade, both within and between the three spheres of government. Now, this fragmentation again led to functional duplication and confusion. Uh, this is actually a very unpleasant reality that we are experiencing in South Africa um, at the moment, even thinking of the significant resource cons constraints that we have. I just want to give an example here if I talk about this overlap. For example, uh, in the environmental context, we have the Minister of Environmental Affairs and Tourism, uh, which constitutes and lead national environmental authority. But we also have several ministries and departments, for example, agriculture, health, um, land affairs, if I think of uh, mineral and energy, uh, water affairs, etc. So, so here, here we have, um, um, pardon me, uh, here we have a, a very clear indication that there's enough legislation, uh, policies and bylaws to support accountable leadership and its implementation and enforcement of the environment. So I want to go to the second last slide and that is of accountable green leadership. Now, we all know the world is going green. From activists who want to save the planet and influence, influence climate change to those uh, maybe just yearning for a simpler, less stress and less complicated lifestyle. But today, the topic of green leadership not only includes in awareness of environmental affairs, but also demands that leaders take a leading role in developing and implementing a sustainable strategy. A recent example of such research was done by uh, Weyman and Patel in 2016 um, on green leadership to empower public hospitals, for example. And the, the aim was to overcome obstacles and challenges in the resource constrained environment. Uh, we all know that health, the healthcare sector itself contributes to climate change uh, creation of hazardous waste, the use of toxic metals such as mercury and water and air pollution. So to address this, for example, uh, the Green Hospitals Network uh, started. It even includes the Hrytiskir Hospital in Cape Town. And they have launched several projects to reduce general waste, energy consumption, food waste, etc. Just a, a second example is the work done by Miller and Pointer at the Green Leadership School. Here, for example, working on projects to decolonize education, their attention is multifocused. Uh, they endeavor to seek ways to recover indigenous cultures, addressing capitalism, for example, um, and emphasizing the environment as a source of knowledge. So here are two a good examples of green leadership that is already uh, moving forward. But ladies and gentlemen, you will see on this slide, I have included several things there at the bottom in the middle. For example, you will see formal documents, the National Development Plan, but I want to quickly refer to, the P to PWC's document, the workforce of the future, the competing forces shaping 2030, and they are very quick to point out that leaders need to consider uh, guiding principles like taking decisive action to manage change and disruption, prepare for changing scenarios, own the automation debate, and then also looking at uh, nurturing agility, adap adaptability, and reskilling. I'm nearly done. Um, I already mentioned the King Report, so uh, uh, who emphasized corporate leadership. Um, you will also see there at the bottom, we have the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, who also remain, reaffirms the importance of supporting the African Union's Agenda of 2063, for example, as well as 
the Nearpat uh, um, initiative. So I, I assume you will agree with me uh, that there are many directives um, and we will definitely in the coming decade uh, see an ideological uh, leadership renaissance, if I can call it like that. It is, uh, it is, of course, anticipated that the growth in the population will place enormous responsibility on leaders to bring about harmony in the climate human uh, ecosystem interaction and the implications for global environmental solutions. Um, South Africa's natural resources also remain crucial for a healthy global economy. Um, uh, it is emphasized that health literacy and the informed or educated new generation is important in the future because it is uh, definitely realized that the sustainability of resources in South Africa is embedded in the principle of education and also the development of the next generation. I think we hope that an educated generation will have the means uh, to look beyond maybe the threats of the fourth industrial revolution, uh, if I think of job losses, for example, and that they rather look towards optimizing opportunities brought forward through the sharing um, e economy, maybe digital services, digital exports, etc. So um, I also want to, you will also see on this slide, there's also a strong relationship between education policy and sustainable uh, development um, in South Africa specifically. On the one hand, we can argue that if education is to play a transformative role in sustainable development, then education policy needs to be fundamentally reorientated as, as it is at the moment, it's not enough. And connected to global processes of economic, cultural and political transformation and the interest, of course, of social and environmental justice. Um, but we can also argue that South African leaders need to rely on lessons and successes of, of the history, rather than continuing to import Western-based uh, models that may be necessary um, that we all apply. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I am going to conclude with this last slide. So it brings us to two questions. Accountable green leadership. I think in future, we'll, uh, uh, this will be um, the two questions that we have to decide or uh, that we have to talk about. First of all, uh, South African leaders can either follow a global um, agenda, moving away from traditional patterns of economic growth and towards a greater emphasis on sustainable development, thus pursuing the 2030 30 agenda for sustainable development and or they can follow a regional development agenda that entails achieving a more radical and structural transformation such as the agenda 2063. I must be honest with you and I'm concluding with that um, statement is I'm not sure what we are following at the moment. We have documents, we have direction but I, I'm not sure what we are following at the moment. And with, this, with that, I give over to the chairperson. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, Liesl. This was a, a great talk. I think I have quite a few questions, um, but, uh, and you've left enough time for, for questions, so thank you for that. Um, usually in these talks, we give people an opportunity to either uh, chat in the chat box if you would like to type a question or if you would um, like to ask, you are very welcome to either put up your hand or um, just activate your mic. I, I will for now not start my video because connectivity was a bit bad. Uh, are there any questions from the floor? I, I know, Sershan, you hinted that you may have a question to ask. I see a hand going up, um, Adrian. I'm not sure if I pronounced it correctly, but um, go ahead. 
Good morning, yes, thank you. Um, unfortunately, I missed the first two uh, seminars. I'm hoping I'll be able to, to get some recording on those. Um, yeah, Lissel, um, a couple of issues, for example, when you talk about the constitution and then you bring in cooperative governance, the reality of it in terms of, sorry, I'm an environmental consultant. Um, the reality of it from an environmental point of view is cooperative governance is used to condone and mask bad environmental management by particularly local authorities. And I talk here about the small local authorities um, and the rural areas, uh, which is where I'm from. Um, you know, you also uh, made reference to Fertiskur and, and all the, all the uh, policies that they're uh, bringing in. None of that is happening in true life in terms of the smaller areas, uh, Scottborough, um, even down past uh, Margate, those sort of areas, inland to Isilbawini and all of those sort of areas. None of that is happening there. And those are all pr major producers of problems. Um, and I think that's something that one should note. I mean, I hear what you're saying. You don't know which one, we're, which, which route we're following. And I think I agree with you. We certainly don't know which route we're following. But from an environmental management point of view, this country is an absolute mess. Um, and I can give you hundreds of examples of it. And, and well, the scary part about it is that when somebody tries to report it or get it sorted, basically cooperative governance is, oh, well, you know, we can't really go against them because they're also government and, and, and we get this excuse all the time. It's just a point I wanted to make. Thank you. A little bit, you want to respond? Yes, I can respond. Sorry, I didn't know whether, whether I should respond. Adrienne, yes, I agree. I used to work in the former water affairs and forestry, and uh, I experienced those challenges as well. I think um, two things that comes to mind is what I also mentioned, uh, education. If we can educate our communities and that they can come and, and pr not put pressure, but alongside municipalities and local government, um, try to um, move forward. I think for me, that at the moment will be the best solution. Uh, we did research in Ghent a municipality about three years ago. They have um, uh, MOU with the Mangahung municipality. And there I have again realized the, the impact of the community. If the community is educated, uh, they actually then take the lead. We, we did research on social innovation where you have the two groups that's working together. But I have not even mentioned, uh, uh, Adrienne, the National Development Plan. That is also a document that you know, that's, that, that gives us a clear guideline. But I hear what you say and I, I understand your challenges. It's definitely there. Thank you for that. Thank, thank you, Lisa. Um, I think we have time for one more quick question and I see Albertina Ramallo, your hand is up. If you can um, uh, unmute yourself. Thank you very much. Uh, and also appreciating the presentation and the workshop itself. Um, I'm very grateful for that because indeed in terms of our environment, we are having a serious challenge, more especially ourselves who are coming from the municipal environment. I'm basically based in the rural based municipality, but then what I just want to take on the environmental affair is the issue of the uh, mobile toilets whereby in most of the environment, you'll find that we are our, our commercial um, businessmen or, or, or people, they are dis discharging the disposals of women waste anyway. So what I'm just taking, or maybe what I can be advised on, coming from the municipal environment, as I've already said, I just want to check how can the Department of Environment assist the municipality in terms of the disposal of human waste, be it a mobile toilet or not mobile toilet, the, the, the waste that are happening in most of our uh, uh, events, that you'll find that there is sometimes uh, the mobile toilets, as I've mentioned, 
or the, the temporary trials that are there, even though it's not mobile. But eventually after the event, you'll find that those uh, waste are taken somewhere to be disposed. Then uh, from our wastewater treatment plants, we are encountering a lot of challenges where you will find that the designing capacity of our infrastructure is accommodating a certain percentage of volume of waste. So when they ask us as the municipality people to discharge within our system, we are unfortunately not allowing them. But eventually, because now they are carrying them, they will dispose them somewhere and they will contaminate the environment. So hence I'm saying uh, from this uh, uh, seminar or workshop, I'm grateful because some of the challenges that we are encountering in our working space can be addressed or can be give, we can be given advices or how can we approach them. Thank you very much. Um, thanks, Albertina, for that question. I'm actually going to ask if um, Liesl or any of the other participants here have uh, some insights into that question, if you could type it in the chat box, please, uh, so that we can move along to our um, next uh, next speaker for the day. Uh, you will you will see there is quite a bit of activity also from um, some other participants on the um, in the chat box. So I'll refer you to that. Um, unfortunately, our slated next speaker has not been able to connect. I know he has uh, connectivity issues. And I am going to introduce you then to uh, Dr. Well, Professor Sam Adelabu, who will be speaking next. He was originally our final speaker. And um, Samuel Adelabu graduated with a Doctor of Philosophy in Geography with a specialization in remote sensing from the University of KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa. And his main research lies in the use of geospatial techniques um, applications. He's currently the head of the Department of Geography and an associate professor at the University of the Free State, coordinating the Earth Observation Unit uh, with a focus on, the G on GIS and remote sensing. Sam has published over 40 articles in accredited journals, attended several conferences, and graduated over 15 postgraduate students, including masters and PhDs. Um, and I am very happy to welcome Sam to the platform. Sam, go ahead. The floor is yours, and you can share the screen. Oh, thank you. Can I be okay? Now I can't share my screen. All right. Let's just do that now. Okay, is my screen visible? Yes, it is. Thanks, Sam. Okay. Thank you very much, Alisa, for this uh, opportunity to present. Um, let me confess from the beginning that what I'm about to present to you, it's, it's a new field that I'm venturing into because I was invited by a group of people to, to join in assessing um, the role of disease outbreak. I am um, a geospatial scientist, so I tend to apply my geospatial uh, uh, techniques and tools to any challenges that I found myself in. And so the title of my um, topic this morning is The Future is Now Understanding the Role of Speeds in Monitoring Future Disease Outbreak. So um, we all know that we live in space. And I've just brought this picture to remind us of how the space look like if we are told I've forgotten. I mean, you will see that Africa is clearly shown on, on the front of that uh, picture. And in understanding our role in space, we need to understand that everything happens in a space. Uh, there is no way we can have anything that will happen without defining the position of it. And uh, according to Oxford Dictionary, space is defined as a dimension of heart, depth, and width within which all things exist and move. So if, if we are going to summarize everything, then we can say that the space is equivalent to the environment in which we live. In within this space, we have a different set of activities that happens. For instance, we have the human activities, 
We have the geographic activities, we have the ecological activities, we have the social activities, we have the food and agricultural systems, among many other things within the function of the space. So when we are talking about the space, in essence, we are talking about the environment in which we live. So if we then talk about space as a function of um, uh, um, where we live or as a function of our environment, it gives us the understanding or it helps us in uncovering more meaning and insight into how things works within our environment. And it will interest you to know that um, when we talk about space or spatial dimensions, there has been great investment in this over the past few years and it's accelerating at a very big rate because of commercial use and uh, the research applications that it brings. Therefore, I am of the view that spatial monitoring, it's an innovative and important component of disease outbreak. And I'm saying this because, uh, and I'm gonna show you as, as time goes on, why I believe that this is key in the next phase of our monitoring process of what happens in, in, in terms of disease outbreak. Now you will see that many a times we have um, um, seen a lot of things, a lot of uh, things said about the beginning, the start of disease outbreak. Sometimes we say it is from bats, from different animals, but these different animals relate with the environment, relate with the space, and then it's transferred to animals. And so therefore we need spatial monitoring in this essence. We need it because we, we could do more research. We could give um, decision-making in, 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 as a result of the research that we do, and that could help us to plan and manage and uh, probably disseminate information across to different people that needs it. Now, I want to start by talking about the early days of spatial monitoring. I'm not sure whether some of us still remember this kind of computer. I recollect that when I was going to the university, we were using disk, um, this small disk that you put inside that small, small area here. And that's how we do it. So uh, I recall it also when I started learning about this spatial analysis, these are the kind of computers that we use. And we have softwares like your ARC, ARC, ARC Info or ARC, um, PC ARC that we used to use in those days. So these are the things that was happening in the early days of, um, of uh, spatial monitoring. And um, some of the things that we, 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 I mean, that was being done in the early stages of spatial monitoring includes maps of disease spreads, uh, like yellow fever and cholera in the 18th centuries, early 18th centuries, which led to the introduction of what we now call medical geography in the late 80s. And then we begin to apply what we call area photography which was in the 1970s, they call it new eyes at that point in time. We have the establishment or the launching of the imagery such as the Landsat one in 1970, which has continuously um, been upgraded even to Landsat eight and probably Landsat nine very soon. And then we started also to predict diseases such as um, uh, cystosomyces, and many other diseases to predict its occurrence in this um, stage. Now, what is the current state? I'm not going to waste much of our time. I'm going to be fast. The current state of disease uh, or spatial monitoring of disease, according to the literature that I've read, it's um, mapping of um, disease outbreak. I, I know some of us are very conversant with uh, these kind of pictures that we used to see in those days. I mean, it has even been localized to South Africa now. We now see that we can actually distinguish or map or 
put in thematic mapping the, the clusters of diseases. We have um, geographic correlation studies that has also been done. We have uh, disease clusters, which, has, uh, which is being done as well. We can look at the clusters of stroke, heart, I mean, heart attack, hypertension, smoking, etc., etc. We also have been also to do spatial temporal changes in different uh, years. There have been a lot of work on this. And uh, recently we focused on uh, prevalence and surveillance of diseases. And uh, I think that was done effectively even for coronavirus mapping in different parts of the country as well. And uh, with uh, more climate driven models, we now have the opportunity of uh, uh, giving early warning strategy and uh, mapping risk analysis of disease outbreak. And uh, it will interest you to know that in the developed world now, um, artificial intelligence is also now being used for disease, uh, spatial monitoring of disease outbreaks in, in, in our world. Now, having said all of this, why do we still then have the spread of diseases? If technologically we have um, developed spatially and we now have things done in the way, why do we still have um, this, the diseases? Why do we still have them being spread? Why can't these spatial things that I'm talking about assist us? I, I just want to give some of the reason. It's, it's because we have um, some anthropogenic activities. Humans are always causing a lot of things. We tend not to forget that, I mean, we tend to forget that our activities affect what will happen, both now and even in the future. And so in some instance, this leads to natural disasters, natural causes as well. And sometimes in our assessment of, of uh, how do we specially monitor this disease outbreak, we exclude factors. Factors such as spatial um, activities or process. We tend to forget that things happen and spread across space. I mean, look, coronavirus has taught us that things can happen in a particular city and spread to the whole world. Uh, 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 this leads us to uh, multi-scale patterns that happen. So what is my view? My view is that the future is now for special monitoring. We need to start to be data intensive. There are massive amount of data that we can use that we are ignoring. This massive data needs to be included in, um, I mean, included with environmental factors across special, D, uh, special domain. We need to have extensive usage of development in spatial data vis-a-vis -vis, um, algorithms and artificial intelligence. Now, knowing this will make us to emphasize, I mean, knowing this will make us to switch from data to knowledge. Now, if we have a lot of data and we have it in massive way, then we can begin to accuse that data together in a spatial way that will bring us to the knowledge of what we are dealing with. It will help even in preventing and in some cases control. It will help in modeling. It, gives, it will give us high level of accuracy. And this spatial knowledge will dominate because of visual appeal and wide availability of spatial techniques, as well as need for cleaner and healthier environments. I have two more slides and I will end. Now, what are the challenges that we will face ahead? Uh, the first one is easy and rapid availability of special data. Now, in the developed world, this is no more the case. But in the developing world, we still have issues with uh, availability of data. And this should be one of the things that we should address. Now, we don't have an excuse because we have been collecting data. What we need to now start to do is to train others as well and have a close collaboration. And when I talk about close collaboration, hello? Okay. Okay. 
Okay, can I continue? Please go ahead. Sorry for the disturbance. Okay. So we need to begin to have close collaborations. And uh, what I've observed from the different uh, presentation in this webinar is that there is need for integration and multidisciplinary approach in mapping disease outbreak. I mean, I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm just a remote sensing scientist, a GIS special applications scientist. So that uses all of this. So it is very, very important for us to begin to work together and begin to use all the knowledge that we have to understand this. Let me end with this slide. The heart, I saw this on the internet. I thought it might be it's useful for us. The heart doesn't need us. It is us that needs the heart. Let's begin to act like this. Thank you, Ari. I go back to you, Arisa. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, sir. I, I appreciate that, and I agree with your um, your last slide in particular. I think the Earth will survive us much better than we'll survive without the planet. Um, and we have time for a, a question, and I see that uh, Sershan's hand is up. So go ahead, Sershan, um, ask your question. Uh Thank you, Samuel, for your talk. Uh, I am a plant physiologist by training, but uh, I've actually uh, made a lot of friends in the GIS world because I think that GIS scientists have more fun. Um, I, I have a very honest question for you, and I, and I hope that you would give our audience an honest answer. Um, there is a considerable advancement that's been made in terms of the use of spatial techniques in the mapping of malaria. Uh, and epidemiologists have partnered very strongly using trans and multidisciplinary approaches with other scientists uh, in terms of mapping. And there is uh, always a case of hot topics becoming hot topics because that's where the funding moves to. Why can't the technologies that have been developed for the mapping of malaria be merely adapted or adopted for the mapping of pandemics such as COVID-19? Why do we need to reinvent the wheel in a sense? Thank you very much for this. I, I, I agree with you. Uh, for me, the issue of uh, pandemic, it's, it's more, uh, uh, let me state from the beginning, I'm not an epidemiologist, so I don't know how disease starts. What I just do is the application. And uh, I think our approach is, in my own view, I might be wrong, our approach is that we are always um, a solver, generally. The technology is there, like you said, for mapping malaria, and it has worked effectively. It has reduced the amount of cases of malaria that we have seen due to this technological advancement. But the challenge that I have is that we tend to always react. We are reactive. We are not preventive. And that's my own worry. And the limitation of that is that if we are not preventive enough, technologies move ahead of us. Now, the way those people even that use the, the first set of people who applied GIS to mapping of malaria did, I think in the early 80s then, it has things have moved beyond that. So if we are not starting to look at preventive ways and the use of spatial monitoring for preventive, uh, preventive measures of disease outbreak, then the technology will move ahead of us. And that's my major, major concern. We never, never ever say that we will have coronavirus. And that is because we did not plan for it. These tools are available. They are always there. I mean, you can to, 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 to apply GIS technology to a to lot of things now. It's, it's quite easy. Data is available as much as possible, maybe not in, in a developed country like ours. But still, if that disease doesn't come, if the outbreak doesn't come, we will not act. I don't know whether I'll do justice to that question. Thank you, Samuel. 
So thanks a lot, Sam. Um, thanks, Sershan. I'm going to hand over to you just now. Um, thank you very much. That was, uh, I think, um, a talk that can deserve a lot more follow up. So if people do have more questions uh, for Samuel, please do go for it in the chat. Uh, also, if your camera is on, could you please, and, and you're not a speaker, could you please uh, stop your video because that might interfere with some people's um, connectivity and overload their network. So thank you so much. And I'm going to hand over to my co-host here, Sersha Naidu, to um, introduce our next speaker. Thank you, colleagues, and thank you, uh, Aliza. Uh, I am uh, especially excited about the next talk. Uh, given the Code Red report that was released last week, or the Code Red report as it is coming to be referred to, um, it has put uh, the climate world in a tailspin, uh, but uh, not a tailspin with regards to things that we did not know about, but a tailspin with regards to some of the terminology that has been used, particularly around terms such as communities at extinction risk. Uh, the comments that have been made around fires in particular, have uh, uh, overlapped with the mass evacuations that we see taking place in Greece, uh, given the recent fires. Uh, Cape Town uh, is not a too distant memory in terms of the fires that we encountered there. And particularly the figures around sea level rise and vulnerable communities and capacitating them to become more resilient to this. And that's why the talk by Dr. Gray Mangeza, and I hope I pronounced that properly, around participatory environmentalism in the new normal, framing post-pandemic futures for climate action praxis, comes at a very, very opportune moment in our dialogue around climate change. Uh, Dr. Mangeza is a social scientist with interest in community development particularly participatory, bottom-up approaches to social change. Gray uses his interest in inclusive development approaches to not only theorize sustainable change, but also critically reflect on the role of science and knowledge in community change. He is currently the head of community development at the University of the Free State and program director in the Faculty of Humanities at the Kwakwa campus. It is indeed my pleasure to now give the floor to Dr. Mangeza uh, for a, a talk that I know is going to trigger a lot of discussion. Dr. Gray, please proceed. Thank you so much and uh, good morning uh, to, to all the attendees and uh, thank you to the guest. Um, I also want to appreciate the two presentations that you've just heard. I am trying to share uh, my screen. Uh, okay. Um, but I am, don't seem to be winning. Can you see my, my screen? Yes, we can. And you can move to presentation mode now. All right, thank you. All right, let me just go to the top. Yep, thank you. Perfect. Brilliant. I'm just going to switch off my uh, video uh, because of the challenges I'm facing with bandwidth at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. My presentation is on participatory environmentalism in the new normal. Uh, framing post-pandemic futures for climate action praxis. And uh, I'm basically extending the position of uh, and uh, the views of the previous two presentations. And I'm also touched by uh, the, the slide by uh, Professor Delabu, the earth does not need us, we need the earth. Um, and it also builds on some of the position, some of the issues that were raised by Lizelle on, on, on uh, 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 green, uh, accountable green leadership. But from where I'm standing, um, right, I can't seem to change my slides. Right, 
from where I'm standing, I'm going to, to, give, to give a socio-historical rationale for an, for an environmentalism focus, uh, participatory environmentalism in the new normal, and also speak about post-pandemic futures of climate action praxis. Uh, as rightfully stated, I'm a social scientist. Um, so my views are coming from a social science perspective uh, and, and basically leaning or gleaning into uh, terrains that are, are not necessarily my specialization, but are particularly my areas of interest. So when we speak of uh, the current situation, uh, once the COVID pandemic is over, if ever it will be over, because we're hearing now of five years, uh, 10 year timelines, we cannot return to business as usual practices that, uh, that increases emissions and maintain pressure on wildlife and biodiversity and the environment in general. Because ultimately all of humanity relies on um, uh, uh, the socioeconomic systems of humanity rely on natural environment and all the ecosystems around it. Having said that, it's also a fact that people have a right to a safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environment, the rights-based issues to, to environmental access, uh, to environmental access to environmental resources. But getting this, these rights and getting these accesses, um, we need to promote issues of environmental sustainability and, re and resilience um, as key areas that need to be emphasized. But having do, doing all these things in the context that I've, I've, I've just presented it, it entails that we also need to expand on our notion of public participation and really begin to ask, what does it mean? There is quite a lot of literature around this uh, with the classical literature from Einstein as far back as the 60s before we even knew of uh, global Armageddon coming. There are five levels of participation, informing, information, consultation, involvement, collaboration, empowerment. Currently, we, we, we don't seem to be at the position of empowerment where we place decision-making in the hands of the public um, in order to create the relevant uh, change that we seek because for simple reason, the economy and economic uh, 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 rationales that inform how society relates to the environment uh, take precedence. Then what is the socio-historical rationale for uh, an environmentalism focus? What is important is that as far back as 2015, within the SDGs, goal 16 of the SDGs calls for responsive, inclusive, participatory, representative decision making at all levels. So participation is ingrained in international, um, in the international processes, in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the international decision making processes. But we are not, we do not seem to be at a position where we begin to frame and argue for effective participation. What is it that we need to depart from? We need to depart from how can we have effective participation? We need, to, we need effective participation by departing from an orthodox scientific paradigm, which has been criticized. And this scientific paradigm upholds a universal, a universal objective reality. Um, that can that breaks down society into component parts and this is done by an impartial or a rational observer who analyzes and acts upon their observation nature or the environment in this way is viewed as a thing separate from human experience uh, so that human beings are able to exploit it without limit and consequence it is seen as an inert and passive. Nature is seen as inert and passive to be managed by human beings and used as a resource 
uh, degraded without fearing the after effects. And the way in which the, for example, environmental management has been structured, it is centralized and there's, there's bureaucratization of environmental matters because traditionally, uh, environmental policy makers have used the neo Malthusian argument that it is exploiting population growth, specifically in the developing world, that is the main cause of environmental destruction, and that poor people, um, rural and indigenous people, forest dwellers, exploit resources selfishly and without restraint. And this is in the literature. So when the state organizes environmental matters or responses to environmental matters, there is a certain level of paternalism towards these people. Um, uh, um, and, and there is almost like a disparaging of traditional ecological knowledge in favor of teaching communities modern conservation practices. Now, again, this is from the literature. Now, all this is now seen uh, a fight back a fusion of bottom-up and scientific resistance to this perspective. A sizable section of the general public and scientific community has already begun to question the wisdom of unlimited socioeconomic growth and the orthodox scientific ideas of human beings being able to insulate themselves from environmental degradation. And this, the questioning has been supported by the emergence of the sustainability paradigm um, in development, which, which upholds environmentally sustainable growth as key for human survival. On the, also, on the other hand, we are seeing ongoing, there has been rather ongoing popular resistance, the Chipko movement in India, the Green Belt movement in, in Kenya, uh, the Green parties in Western Europe, and now we talk of uh, all these other environmental accords, the Paris Accord, and uh, the latest one, which uh, session just mentioned. And all this has resulted in us getting to a point where we have a pandemic, um, just to link to the topic of the workshop with the pandemic, and how do we, how do we use the pandemic as an opportunity or as a space in which we can derive important uh, uh, lessons for climate change, for, for growth. The one thing uh, that this pandemic has shown is that um, it, 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 it provides humanity with a foretaste of what a full-fledged crisis, climate crisis, could entail in terms of uh, simultaneous exogenous shocks, on the one hand, to supply and demand, disruption of supply chains and global transmission and amplification mechanisms. Pandemics and climate risk also share many similar attributes. Both are systemic in that their direct manifestations and knock-on effects propagate fast across an interconnected world. We have seen it with, with, uh, with, uh, with, with COVID, started in China, now it's all over the world, but we are also seeing it with climate change, um, the increase in CO2 emissions, the increase in CO2 levels, also causing uh, uh, disruptions all over the world with the fires that have just been mentioned, uh, certain communities at the verge of extinction, um, and all, all, all those things. They are, both, they are also non-stationary in that probabilities and distributions of occurrences are shifting and proving to be inadequate uh, or insufficient for future projections. They are, they are risk multipliers in that they highlight and exacerbate untested vulnerabilities inherent in the financial and healthcare systems. In the financial and healthcare system, we've seen the pressure of, 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 uh, of, of COVID on the healthcare system, but we are also seeing uh, the capacity of the earth in terms of, again, the CO2 levels, 
the changes um, in air quality and all that. They're also regressive in that uh, they affect disproportionately the most vulnerable populations and subpopulations of the world. I know some people have said that uh, COVID is, a, is, is an equalizer, but if we look at uh, uh, the most affected, it's normally those in the uh, vulner most vulnerable, whether vulnerable is the older population or the poor population from an economic uh, perspective. So how do we then frame a post-pandemic um, post-pandemic reality uh, or framing a post-pandemic climate praxis. It's, it's, these are just some suggestions around it, but at the center of that is resiliency. We need to, to build um, uh, uh, resilient systems uh, that are able to withstand shocks. But building resiliency cannot be done on the current econ socioeconomic models or current consumption uh, trends. It means we need to create a resilient system by also changing the manner in which we look at, um, we practice our science, and we also look at uh, external realities. The first one is we need to build the capability to model climate risk and to assess the economics of climate change. This would help inform recovery programs, update and enhance historical models that are, for example, used for infrastructure, planning, and enable the use of climate stress testing. Um, when we do, when international organizations, for example, fund, there has to be climate stress testing involved to ensure that all funding mechanisms have um, a climate change agenda. Secondly, we also need to devote, there is need to devote a portion of the virus, of the vast resources deployed for economic recovery to climate change resiliency and mitigation. This would include investments in, in a broad range of sustainability levers, including building renewable energy infrastructure, expanding the capacity of the power grid, and increasing its resiliency to support increased electrification um, and retrofitting buildings. It's a common conversation we're having in South Africa. For example, South Africa is, is, is a huge carbon footprint Power is generated through coal. Uh, it's important to, 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 to diversify the, 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 the power grid and also increase um, the non-coal sources of energy. The other option as well, as you can see there, is to increase is to increase national and international alignment and collaboration on sustainability for it, because it's quite clear now most of the problems we are facing cannot be solved nationally. Um, and I think with COVID, we have also seen that vaccine nationalism uh, is, 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 is a useless act and that does not assist much in terms of uh, uh, dealing away with a common problem. So the human solidarity, the need to create uh, more honest, intentional, and authentic global partnerships to deal with climate change become urgent, much more than they were prior to, 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 to the COVID, prior to COVID. Then we also need to talk about decarbonization as well uh, as, as, uh, as, 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 as an important element because by decarbonizing, we can prioritize the retirement of economically marginal and, and, and carbon intensive assets, uh, which really have not have saved their lifetime and their purpose. So in order to frame post pandemic futures, I've, I've put in place three questions there. What lessons can be learned from the current, current pandemic for climate change? I've tried to provide some of those lessons. 
what implications, positive or negative, um, does our pand pandemic responses hold for climate change? And what steps could the private, public, and civic sectors take to align pandemic responses with sustainability imperatives? So all these questions are basically questions that would be important in framing um, some of the initiatives, some of the practices that we would need to do uh, in order to frame a post-pandemic future. Um, thank you so much. That's my schlep. Thank you, Greg. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think uh, it's triggered uh, a lot of uh, interesting discussion in the chat box. And uh, I want to call now for questions from our participants. You can stop sharing. If you can use the raised hand function to pose any questions to the speaker. Yes, Adrian. Sorry, me again. Um, just to, hi, thank you very much for, for some very interesting talks. Um, I, I'd like to, to refer back to the resiliency slide that has just been shown. Um, and, and in a way, I'm going to probably uh, show off my age. And I say show off my age because I've earned my stripes and my colors. Um, 25 years ago, when we all started as environmentalists talking about climate change, we were all mad greenies or, you know, insane tree huggers. And the reality of it, that slide really is a slide that, that, that was out there 20 years ago, where we talked about decarbonization and, and all of that sort of thing. And yet we're still talking about it, and we're still talking about it at an academic level. And so I have to go right back to, to the first speaker who said, Education is the key, um, and I don't disagree with that, but how do we then get to this education of communities? Um, you know, I've, I've often, uh, well, I have on many, many occasions and many, many international and national uh, seminars and, and conferences and now webinars said, should we not be including environmental management and sustainability and its true form, and I talk about it not as it's as it is at the moment, which is really a very flippant statement. Um, in things like high school uh, uh, um, curriculums and so on. And I would just like to know how, how the high academic, academic people who have been speaking today would react to something like that. Um, it would be just an interesting to see how, how everyone would respond to, to that statement. But sadly, what has been put forward now was put forward at least 25 years ago. And that for me is probably, the, I'm at the end of my career, but that for me is probably the one of the most scary parts that I'm, I, I can actually say. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. I'm going to give uh, Gray the opportunity to respond to that question first, and then I'll move to Lisa. Thank you so, so much. And I'm glad uh, that, you know, this is a question that was raised 25 years ago. Some literature even goes further than 25 years ago. Um, we have not moved. What we have just been doing is to change the deck chairs in a sinking Titanic. We have not moved. Um, all the principles, the right principles, decarbonization, uh, global cooperation, all those principles are there. It's not like humanity is not aware of the solutions that are required in order to really uh, move, um, really move the conversation and really move the needle in terms of uh, climate change. So there has not been any progress. What there has been actually is um, an increase in consumption, an extra pressure on, um, on the environment. Um, and, and, and that has not benefited humanity or the environment at all. So yes, we might be talking about the same conversation now that was being held 25 years ago. If we do not, if we do not see the urgency of, of climate change, I think now uh, I've just, I've, I, I've, I was reading something and I, and, and I was shocked to see that we are left with about 25 years 
uh, in terms of how far the, the earth can continue to absorb the carbon that we are emitting. So it's, it's really um, um, a situation that is not, that we, it's a really a situation of humanity not seeking to progress and, and, and the education system as well, uh, becoming almost like a talk shop and not necessarily getting into action on the ground uh, and, and, re, and, and, and forcing uh, uh, the, the right people or the right institutions to, to apply their policies or their policy promises. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Gray. Uh, Liesl, you had a comment? Um, colleagues, uh, maybe I am naive uh, in a sense, but I want to differ a little bit uh, with my colleague when he say that uh, there was no movement. I do feel since 1994 there was, uh, there is a movement, my, maybe not against the pace that we want, but just taking the recent um, uh, situation with COVID. I mean, we, we had a, a challenge with everyone taking the vaccine or not, and and with with a little bit of education, there was movement. Um, but what I would like to to emphasize um, with regard to your questions, Adrien, um, I think I'm also near, nearer to the end of my career as to the beginning of my career, but I think if we start with our undergraduate students, if I have those students in front of me, I have, for example, now 570 in my first year class, I ask them to go out and share what we have discussed during the day, and I try to really um, assist them in making objective arguments so that they can contribute. So I would say the undergraduates that we have in our classes is, is, a, is a source that goes back to the community. That student go back to his or her household that evening and talk about what we have discussed in class. And so it's a sense of sharing that information. And I'm now talking about the Generation Z group that we are having. But I also want to move forward and say, if we move to our research students, to our postgraduate students, I think we must really start focusing as supervisors on action research. Um, and and the, the qualitative type of literature reviews that we, we like to do, that we move uh, or that we combine that more with, qual uh, with um, action research so that it can be applied um, in the, the communities. And then, like I said previously, the whole aspect of social innovation, I think that is something that uh, we can really ponder on and, and get uh, communities uh, involved. Thank you for that. Uh, Adrian, if you're adding on to that comment, uh, I'm, I'm going to allow it, but I also want to open it up to the rest of the, the participants. Uh, I think we are moving towards a very interesting discussion point here, and I want to get to the nut and bolts about action and how. Thank you, Sushin. Yes, no, I just I just I have to disagree with Liesl, sorry. Um, <laughs> I, I, Liesl, not every student and not every person or every youth in this country gets to, to university. And I think that's the truth of it. Um, I certainly wasn't um, that lucky or that fortunate. Um, but the reality of it is, is that to the very best of our, uh, the, the ability that one has, most of the children in this country at least get through to a grade eight uh, or at least a grade 10 or, a, or an 11 some of them get through to, to matric. And that I think is the vast majority. And they are just as equally as influential with their families. So for me, sorry, I don't think going undergraduate is the answer. I think you have to be looking at something where we can um, grab more people into this net. Thank you. So colleagues, I'd like to move the, the discussion uh, 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 taking points from a 
uh, Adrian and uh, Liesel, uh, as well as Gray. Uh, so I'd like to make three points uh, that uh, I believe have emerged from our discussion today. Uh, one is that we are actually dealing with a socio-environmental crisis in, in climate change. Uh, two, that the language of climate change has not necessarily been translated uh, equally well across the globe. And perhaps some of the goals that have been set in terms of climate change mitigation need to be more context specific. For example, there is now very reliable data that many of the countries that were signatories to the sustainable development goals have actually retrogressed in terms of their progress towards achieving these goals. So they may actually be in the new normal, a need for people to not just revisit the sustainable development goals, but actually to set their own. Uh, some of these goals are seen to be as unachievable for the developing world context. So, so that's one point I'd like to make. The last point around education, I don't think we can start to make statements around undergraduate is not the answer or school is not the answer. I think we need to move the conversation towards what are all our opportunities for educating people around climate change mitigation? And can we tap as many of those opportunities as possible? And I want to use the vaccine uh, you know, uh, uh, rollout as an example. Originally, government saw the opportunity to actually roll it out at government established vaccine stations. And then they suddenly realized that actually they need to open it up to the private sector, they need to open it up to industry, and then the mines were actually the trendsetters in actually administering vaccines to miners on site. So I think climate language, climate awareness, and climate education needs to take place in as many settings as possible. And we, as the informed, are responsible for dishing out this meal. How we dish it out, whether it's a cold meal, a hot meal, dessert, an, an entree, or the main course is left to us. But I think the message that has come across very strongly uh, today is that the key lies in awareness raising, knowledge sharing, and making climate language translatable and digestible. And I'm going to leave the last word to my, my colleague, uh, Aliza, uh, to close the session. But I, I want to thank all our speakers from today. And I want you to please save the date, 19th August, uh, which is when the series, which has now ex extended across three weeks, will close with two keynote speakers, uh, um, notably one from Oxford. Um, and uh, it will be circulated, the adverts around uh, the keynote addresses. But I hope that you join us for the closing of the session uh, next week. Uh, sorry, on the 19th of August. And Aliza, the, the closing word belongs to you. Uh, thank you, Sirson. Uh, I think you've definitely uh, captured a, a lot of the major thoughts there. And thank you, everybody, for being part of this uh, third session. I feel like there's still a lot of conversation that should be continuing here. Uh, it could be, and I, I have to agree with everybody who who emphasized how how important it is to have some some more bottom up approaches and to have uh, also a social science and uh, an understanding of the public administration and so on in, involved in these major crises this is not uh, a, a, a natural science problem and this is something i think we can all agree to if we can work together and figure that one out so thank you colleagues thank you everybody for participating thank you to the speakers you have all um, given us fantastic perspectives to uh, think about and i hope to see you all again next week same time same place for our um, final session 
uh, of, the, of this series. Thank you very much and have a fantastic Thursday, everybody.